I'm going to rattle through very quickly here. I can, one thing I can assure you of is that I will be unlikely to say anything profound. This will be fairly light. In fact, it's primarily a photographic tour of some of the things we have been doing around responsible tourism in the Mourns. Uh, just to start off, that's who we are, Mourn Heritage Trust. Our primary focus is to manage the Mourn area of outstanding natural beauty. But uh, while that's in pursuit of a statutory designation, we're not a statutory body. We're a charitable trust, an independent trust. We apply every year for our funding, and then we use whatever core funding we get to go and try and get some more. Um, our current situation is, with three weeks to go to the start of the new financial year, we don't even know if the Environment Agency, our biggest funder, is on board. So that's just to put in context maybe some of the questions around the hand-to-mouth uh, issue that's been touched on. Um, just a wee bit on our credentials in terms of sustainable tourism. The Mourns was actually the first area in Ireland or the UK to achieve the Europark Charter for Sustainable Tourism. Um, one more on the island of Ireland has followed, that's the Causeway Coast and Glens, and many more have followed in the UK, and we were delighted to be at the start of that movement. Um, we also then were more delighted and surprised in a ceremony at the European Parliament in 2013 to be awarded one of Europark's six awards celebrating its 40th anniversary. Um, and they picked out a number of folk for contribution to sustainable tourism. And we were in high company with Catalonia and Andalusia from Spain, the Cévennes and Massif Central in France, and at least Federation of National Parks. Um, so that both surprised and delighted us. And then just to say a little about our next step on sustainable tourism, along with our local authorities, we have managed to secure significant funding from EU competitiveness programmes to take 120 businesses in the Mourns and our neighbouring destination, Strangford Lock, through green tourism accreditation, uh, and also then to do some marketing around uh, green tourism. So we, your messages, Javier, were very timely. Uh, just want to say, Alain, as I said, a little bit about what we've been doing. A lot of the focus over the last three or four years has been on infrastructure, not exclusively, but a lot of it. So just to give you a sense of some of those things, um, we, we are conscious of the issue uh, around sustainable transport, and we've worked hard on that. But equally, we're conscious that the vast bulk of our visitors do and still will come by car. So the Mourne Coastal driving route has been a key development for us. Um, we're also keen, uh, looking at the example of the Wide Atlantic Way, to learn from Paddy's experiences and hopefully to work with Falcha Ireland and Tourism NI to look at the East Coast and how perhaps uh, the benefits of the Wide Atlantic Way could be brought right around the whole island. Um, and this is, I suppose, our first step, the Mourne Coastal route, uh, where we invested in signature identification around amenity sites and various interpretive forms of uh, or various forms of interpretation viewing platforms panels where if you look through the hole in that panel it frames the summit of sleeve donard uh, and also employing quite a bit of public art if you look at this piece um, not so much the structure of the rock which is designed to mimic the rocky coast but you could maybe see in the gap in between the outline of a smuggler's head that is the smuggler's head, is the name of the piece, uh, and signifies the uh, connection of that part of coast with smuggling brandy from the Isle of Man and over the mountains. That's another piece in Castle Wellen celebrating the market town, traditional music, um, and that celebrates the flax growing linen industry, which was an important part of our industrial heritage. Uh, and I'm mindful always of a, of a definition Paddy gave once of sustainable tourism that, it, that emphasised happy locals as well as happy visitors. So obviously there was lots of consultation involved in this and there are some happy locals. Um, another form of trail then off the coastal route uh, is mountain biking. These trails were developed by our local authorities in conjunction with outdoor recreation in Northern Ireland and are now managed. Uh, by ourselves. This is really just to give you a glimpse of what we feel are outstanding mountain bike trails with fantastic scenery and great access to services. So do please come and see them, any of you who are interested. That's what's become known as Kodak Corner in Restrever, uh, a more family-oriented trails then in Castle Wellen. And this is part of what we do. More happy locals there, or maybe not so happy, are youth rangers being put to heavy labour. But in terms of our infrastructure, I suppose what I want to focus on primarily is our Upland Path project. Um, and we felt this was really an example of joined up government, which doesn't happen terribly often in Northern Ireland. But it, it was an environmental measure 
primarily to control erosion, but also uh, to provide a good walking experience. Um, so it was supported by our environment agency, our tourist board, and our sports body. Um, <clears throat> the talk about the Great Wall of China being visible from space, this path on the summit of Slave Binion was visible from pretty high up. You can, I think you can see the very strongly eroded scar uh, on the left of that picture. This is more closely on Slave Donard, where you can see a star of paths shooting off in all directions. And this is a close up you know, where paths start to re resemble dry riverbeds. Now, this was a major undertaking, it was a major project. Three million pounds in total went in to cover 3.67 kilometres in the high moorns. Um, that, that is what it takes, but we are talking about a special area of conservation and Northern Ireland's most used area for recreation given its accessibility. Uh, and those are just a couple of shots that sum up what a major under undertaking it was. And it wasn't all about machines, a lot of hard labour and broken spades. Um, Important to acknowledge contribution of partners. Helen Lawless, some of you will recognise, was here this morning, but has had the head off from Mountaineering Ireland. Uh, we didn't get everything right when we started this, but through consulting and evolving, uh, through the like of Helen and the Ulster Federation of Rambling Clubs, we produced what seems to be recognised as a good outcome. Uh, and these are just some, of, some shots of what we did. Little trick of the trade that we found that for all the artificial materials available, the best foundation for an upland path is sheep's fleeces. So that created a few happy locals as well with the farmers from whom we bought those. And then on top of that, we compacted mineral soil, in most cases trying to avoid hard stone pitching where we could. Uh, so these are just some of the results of that project. Uh, this was one of the, the main paths up Binion, the one that you could see in the satellite image before the works. That's looking down the same path afterwards. That's one near Ben Crum Dam. That's one on Binion as well. Um, and really what it's been about is taking that uh, visual scarring and loss of habitat <coughs> and blending the path into the environment while maintaining the challenge of walking in the uplands. Again, a close up of where we've uh, narrowed down the path. Um, and as was touched on earlier, Visitors do stick to these. We have clearly observed that, and these paths will be sustainable. Um, and it, it puts me again in mind of Paddy's comment about more visitors aren't necessarily more damage. Uh, these paths will now sustain more visitors. We could have started reducing the number of visitors, but had ongoing damage. Um, and I would encourage any of you, wherever you are, if you see erosion, start, nip it in the bud before you need to spend three million. And don't necessarily rely on the government agencies and the landowners. We did this. Uh, we got the consent of the landowner, obviously, got the funding from government, but we as a charity did it. There's more happy locals who helped. Uh, and we now have a volunteer path team who do stitch and time work for us. Um, but also to say, and uh, Carol's point earlier struck me in this, Ireland's very different in a lot of ways from other parts of the world, and one of those is access to the countryside and land ownership. Uh, if we don't keep the neighbouring land farmers happy, we're in trouble. So our ranger service is really important in terms of little interventions, a fence here, a sign there, uh, a bit of a way marker, a bridge which was put in at the behest of landowners that have solved lots of trouble and turned unhappy locals into happy locals. Um, and then really just to, to wind up in terms of what we've moved on to, telling stories. We've, we've upped our infrastructure, um, telling some of the stories around the area. And not so much this one. Um, turf cutting was an important part of the story of the area, but it's done in lots of parts of Ireland. So we tried to look at stories that were unique to the Moorns, and this is one of them. Many of you will recognise this as the map from the Narnia stories. So this is Narnia, but this is Narnia too. This is Restrever and the Clockmore Stone on Sleeve Martin above Carlingford Lock. C.S. Lewis spent his boyhood holidays there, and he has said, my idea of Narnia is the hills above Restrever. So we put in the trail to the top so that visitors can enjoy that. And we have at low level the family oriented trail, which you enter via the wardrobe as you would as if you were going into Narnia. Uh, and then we have various art installations to bring to life the stories. Patter Twig's home, Patter Twig was, I think, the talking squirrel. And the willow people represent the dryads who were the spirit of the trees who could take human form. These are the thrones of the kings and queens of Narnia. And this shot shows how much the local community has embraced it, which we're delighted with. That's more happy locals who will become our guides of the future, we hope. 
Uh, another one is Tullymore Forest, where there were stories untold, like this one. That's Lord Limerick. Uh, like many of the aristocracy of his day, he went on a European tour, the Grand Tour, and by all accounts, he was quite a boy. He got up to all sorts of shenanigans in the uh, salubrious and less salubrious parts of Paris and Rome. But he also saw things like this. This is not in the Morns, it's in the Alps. It's a pack horse bridge. But he took the ideas back, and with the collaboration of Thomas Wright, the great renowned landscape architect, mimicked some of the structures he saw. So there are bridges, follies, gates throughout Tullymore that have fascinating stories attached to each one. So they've been restored from quite dilapidated states and interpretation put in. So just another story that we've been able to bring out. Another one is the supply of water from the high mountains. Uh, paths have been enhanced there, including access for all. And we are about to reinstate in the Silent Valley that house, which was one of the, the houses from Watertown, which, believe it or not, was the first town in Ireland to have electric street lighting, and is no more. There is no trace. It had its own cinema, hospital, and policeman uh, to facilitate the building of the dams in the 20s and then disappeared without trace. But we've managed to get that one house, and it will go back in the valley to tell the story of the workers. And then finally, uh, the granite, more granite story is another one that we're really trying to push uh, and bring alive. So we have a granite trail that shows uh, some of the things like the bogey trucks which brought the stone down the mountains. We've extended that to make a loop that takes in places like this where they're just frozen in time. Curbstones cut, presumably intended for Belfast, Liverpool or Manchester, but never got off the mountain and to take in quarries like this one, literally frozen. And we have a little exhibition in another restored building, the Corn Mill in Annalong, where a Miller character takes you through not just the story of the mill, but the story of Moor and Granite and all the places to which it went, which, believe it or not, included New York. And that's our app. And, of course, there's the local use of the stone with our idiosyncratic and characteristic dry stone walls and involving people in the restoration of those. Um, so really that was very much a, a whistle-stop tour. Um, <clears throat> as I said, nothing particularly profound in there, but it was just uh, to give you a little bit of the flavour of the things we've been doing in the north, um, which I hope has been useful and happy as if anybody wants to contact us for further details on that. Okay. <clears throat>